Hi, Darlene. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. You are the guru of all things codependency. So I knew I had to have you on the relationship podcast. So you've written a lot of books. How many have you written? 10, including a second edition. Wow. How do you find the time, the energy to like write so many books? Well, I enjoy it for one thing. And I have to um, cut back on my social life when I'm writing a book. So is there a like amount of time that it typically takes you to finish or create a book? Um, it depends. My paperbacks take took about a year. Each. Okay. And some of the ebooks are a little shorter, so it depends on the length of the book. Okay. Well, so we definitely have an expert in the room, and one of the things that you write quite a bit about is codependency. In fact, you wrote Codependency for Dummies. How do you get to write a dumb one of the dummies books? How does that happen? Well, I had written a blog about uh, are you codependent? Okay. And the dummies uh, ed editors found me and they said that they were uh, approaching various uh, writers and therapists uh, to write this book and that I should do an outline and a chapter and then they would decide who would be awarded the contract. So once they, uh, wow. Me, uh, and I started doing the outline, I realized that I, I was like made for this like, <laughs> and I knew so oh. much about it. So, um, they, before I even finished the chapter, they gave it to me. So. Wow. Congratulations. That's quite an honor. Thank you. And then after that, about a year later, Hazelton had read that book and they liked it. And then they asked me to write another book, a book on shame and codependency. So, yeah, they are very closely connected. And I don't think we therapists talk enough about the role that shame takes in why we do the things that we do or why we respond to things things that we respond to so i would definitely want to make sure we talk about that yeah shame is the core it's i wrote an article for a therapist uh, journal and i call it the elephant in the room because a lot of therapists don't address it they give you behavior is that because we don't know how to address it well i think first of all in western society it's not talked about a lot yeah. In collectivist cultures in Asia, Latin America, uh, Russia, uh, Asia, they shame is very front and center. You're ashamed to the family. You're bringing shame on, you know, our reputation, the neighbors. Um, students in Korea commit suicide if they didn't get into the uh, the college that they studied for because it's such a shame on and a sacrifice for their, their family. So people are publicly shamed. I had a student, I mean, a client who was a student in Mexico and she was being abused at home and she was not, she was failing some of her tests. So the teacher put her in the front of the room and told all the students to ba basically shame her, call her a dummy. Oh. It's just horrific. So public shaming, I mean, it goes back centuries, right? It's still done in a lot of, in the Middle East and a lot of places, Russia. So, um, yes, but in the West, it's more guilt. Yeah. So is that our version of shame? Because I don't, I, I think back and I don't know that many of us have modeling from our family of origin, how to handle shame, how to talk about shame, how to yeah. process shame. Shame is still going on. There's a lot of bullying is, you know, big, big issue now. Mm -hmm. uh, parents say, well, don't listen to that boy or that girl and that's not helpful yeah just dismiss it push it away put it in a compartment somewhere and don't go near it right the two things that a child needs and i'm gonna this will tie into how to respond to a child's feelings and being bullied is they need to be mirrored they need to know that you see and understand their feelings yeah. and empathize with them and then they need help like you know what to do here i'll comfort you or uh, let's get him more information or set a boundary or something. So just saying, you know, don't feel that way or um, 
don't let it bother you. They don't know what they're talking about, things like that. It's not marrying and empathizing with the child. And that's one way the codependency begins. It's like shaming, it's repressing your feelings. So every child needs to feel that it's love for who they are, not conditional love, not because they're pretty, athletic, got good grades, you know, are good, well behaved, that they need to be loved in all aspects, just and that the child the parent is interested in spending time with them, knowing them. What is your sense of why parents may struggle? Because I want to hold our parents in a positive perspective that they're doing the best they can. What's creating a difficulty in a parent giving them that endorsement that you are wonderful the way that you are? Is that messaging being handed down from generation or what, what do you think is happening? Yes, codependency is transgenerational. And there's something called transferred shame. So when a parent and a lot of times it's inadvertent. I mean, certainly there, there are families where the parents are horrific. They say, I wish you wouldn't have been born. I wish you were a boy or a girl or, or you, you cause, you know, your father's heart attack, like horrible things that they mm -hmm. say. I tried to abort you. A lot of direct shaming. But most shaming is inadvertent. So the parent is too busy. Mm. They're not making eye contact. They're not paying attention. Or as I said, they minimize, they try to be helpful and say, you shouldn't be afraid. You shouldn't be angry. You shouldn't be hurt. They didn't mean it. You know, they, they don't know what they're talking about. So that's again, shaming. And then the, then as adults, these children do it to themselves. Mm. And many codependents. And you think that that's, yeah, especially women do, do you are not comfortable with their anger because uh -huh. it was not allowed growing up. And do you think that the parents are sort of minimizing it because that somehow stems in their worries that they're not a good enough parent, that they're having guilt and shame, that they have children that are having these big emotions and they don't know how to talk to them about it, or worse, they don't know how to fix those feelings. So instead of them facing that maybe they need some parenting skills or they're dropping the ball in some way that they're sort of innocently, I guess, trying to minimize their children's distress so that they don't have to experience distress. Right. I mean, there's multiple reasons, and especially in public. If a child has a tantrum or something in public is crying, then the parent is feeling ashamed that they can't control their child, that it reflects on them. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to the beginning. What do you define as code codependency? What are the behaviors or the ways of being that come up for you over and over again as, as what you define as codependent? Okay, well, let me first say there's no one definition. There's been multiple definitions by different theorists. Okay. Um, but I thought long and hard about it when I wrote the book and some definitions involved another person. But to me, codependency is within, it's your relationship with yourself is how, how it starts. It may be more manifest and obvious when you're in a relationship with someone else, mm -hmm. but it's a dysfunctional relationship with yourself. So I say it's a, a person who can't, who's can't access their inner self, their true self or their real self, or whatever you call it. And instead their thinking and their behavior revolve around another person or it could be a substance, or it could be a process. So I include addicts as codependents. They're codependent with their object of their addiction. And then it also shows up in relationships. So that's a little different than, than some people yes. would say, you know, there's codependents and there's addicts. They're one or the other. But abusers are codependent too. It's just sometimes the anger is repressed or indirect or passive aggressive. And, and, and the person is a pleaser. And sometimes it's direct controlling yourself or controlling someone else. And so we have, we start this typically with our family of origin, and then we sort of develop a way of being, I kind of view it as 
coping skill, right? Active, but you've decided that this is a way that you can get your needs met because we have to get through childhood. And so then you just continue using these behaviors in your romantic relationships and yes. your friendships and your work relationships. I wrote a blog. I have like over about 250 blogs on my website. So there's one called Paradise Loss. What happened to my true self? And I go into how it started mm. in infancy. So as, if a mother is depressed, preoccupied, or personality disorder, or addicted, or just too many children, whatever, yeah. and she can't attune to the baby's needs. So the baby in a healthy situation would feel, they talk about bliss. You know, he's wet, he's changed, he's hungry, he's fed. He's lonely or sad, he's held or rocked. His needs are met. The mother is supposed to attune, tune in, is what that means, to the baby and respond naturally, intuitively. But if a mother, for whatever reason, can't do that, then that baby becomes anxious. And instead of just uh, feeling how it feels inside and everything is wonderful, it starts scanning the environment. When is mother coming? What will the expression on her face be? Will she be angry, sad? You know, Will she be available to me? And so then they start looking externally. And it starts like that. And then the baby may then get um, adapt to what the mother wants. Mm -hmm. So if I cry, you know, she's going to be upset. You know, if I, I have to try to figure out, be hyper vigilant, figure out what she wants, and please her. So that accommodating and start instead of the mother attuning to the baby, the baby starts attuning to the mother. And as they get older, they find out that, you know, mother doesn't like it when I'm, you know, cry or when I'm angry, you know, or she'll spank me or she'll leave, or I saw what happened to my brother or sister. So I better please her to survive because that relationship is more important than anything. And then codependents uh, repeat that, especially in intimate relationships with bring up all of these primal feelings as your relationship with your first caretaker usually your mother is the most important in developing these habits and skills. So to your point, there's no opportunity for me to get connected with my true self. There's no exploring. There's no tying, you know, trying on new things because I'm so hyper vigilant and making sure that I get my parents to still want to provide me my needs that that's that's a survival skill and i don't get to have the experience of being a kid that's right i mean there could be other manifestations of it some children yeah. rebel and they find out well, if i'm angry then i'll get my needs met and the person there's personality differences too that are genetic and some just withdraw um but yes they would adapt and that's how they they cope to survive. You're absolutely right. But it doesn't work as an adult. So you, because you this is an organic, because this is an organic way of being, mm -hmm. do most of us probably don't realize it then until we get into a romantic relationship, because it's just kind of always been the way that we existed with our family of origin. So then we don't recognize it as a problem until we set set into our next set of relationships. Right. You still might not realize it's a problem, especially if you're in a relationship with an abuser or an addict. You think they're the problem. So, you know, sometimes you attract what you've repressed. So, again, my example, if you're not comfortable with your anger, you might attract your um, shadow, someone who's very angry, who expresses it, things like that. So that's and usually People come into therapy, they don't usually say, I think I'm codependent. Some do now if they've read my book, but they come because they're anxious mm. or they're depressed. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the other ways we've coped that um, prevents us from getting to the true self, what you said, is that we develop a, a hyperactive superego. Our superego is our conscience. Mm. So that helps us know right and wrong. 
and can guide us. But if you've had a dysfunctional childhood with abuse or not good parenting, that voice will start reprimanding you in, again, in order to survive. So, you know, you shouldn't, there's a rule, it makes rules. Mm. You know, you shouldn't cry or, you know, daddy is going to think that I'm a sissy or something. Or if I'm too loud, mother's going to think that, you know, I'm, I'm bad. I'm not nice. And so it tells you what to do and shames you. You sh all the shoulds. I have to be perfect. So I don't get in trouble. I have to obey all these rules. Mm -hmm. So that's your critic, the inner critic. It's, um, Karen Horn, I, uh, in the fifties, and I quote her in, in my books, um, coined the phrase, the tyranny of the shoulds. Mm. So if you're shooting on yourself, <laughs> that's the first step in recovery is getting in touch with the voices in your head that are ruling you. Your parent could be long gone or dead and they living in your head, you're taking renting space in your brain and you're still living with them. Because you still think that the only way to get your needs met is externally, right? So I've got to find some outward part to fill me up because I haven't got a chance to learn about my true self. So I probably have no idea what my needs are, how to get my needs met, but I do know how to get other people to like me or to please them so that I can feel. You brought up something very important, but there's a missing step. Let me point that out. Okay. Yes, the, the critic is going to keep shaming you. And that causes depression and anxiety, which is a symptom. So people don't realize it's often from their own voices in their head. Um, and that keeps you away from your, yourself. But you mentioned about looking outside of yourself. So here's the thing. When you're disconnected from your true self, you're going to look outside yourself, whether it's an activity, a process, a food, a person to feel okay. Mm. And it, it works for a while, the high from a romance, the high from gambling, or the satisfaction from eating, or the high from a drug, you know, you do feel better, initially, and there's a price to pay. Mm. But the point I was going to make is that the more you look outside yourself, the further the gap gets between your real self, and, uh, you know, your persona who you are you get further and further away the more you look outside and so it gets worse instead and then it's not satisfying so I'll drink more or I have to get more sex or you know exercise more or eat more or shop more whatever the addiction or the habit is to feel okay and then the next thing the other main symptom of codependency aside from low self-esteem and shame that goes together is control so i have to control you and control myself so that what you think of me is good so then i'll feel lovable instead of i'm lovable of course the shame is blocking that i have to behave a certain way or uh, shape what you think so that you'll like me and love me and then things will be good and peaceful and i'll feel okay Sometimes sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like with a narcissist, they're are very parallel to a, a codependent. I think they're codependent too. And they will dictate mm. to you. They'll tell you right out how you should behave so that they'll feel okay. They want you to uh, intuit their every need and want and fill it. So. Is that attractive to someone who's codependent? Because now I have like a roadmap of like how to keep things in control and make sure that you love me or want to keep me around. Does that work yeah. in some dysfunctional way? I don't think it starts out that way consciously. It starts out with mm -hmm. they both want to be loved by each other. They're dating. It's romantic. Mm -hmm. A narcissist could be very charming and seductive. And uh, their main goal is for you to like them. And they're very good at manipulation and making people like them. In fact, one study showed that um, the in, in interviews, it took a group like seven meetings with a narcissist to figure out that they didn't like the person. They like them. <laughs> Six times they met. The seventh time, 
they started to see through the facade because their whole personality is a facade. So that starts out in the initially, and then you want to please, and you go along to get along. A narcissist wants to get ahead. The, the codependent wants to get along. So that's mm -hmm. a main, mm -hmm. they have different agendas. So mm -hmm. I just wrote this book and researched a lot on narcissism. So um, codependents will sacrifice themselves for the sake of the relationship. But a narcissist will sacrifice the relationship for themselves. So if you think it through, they both put the narcissist first. The narcissist- Which makes, uh, would that make a codependent very attractive then to a narcissist? Yeah, right. So they both, that works for a while, but more and more, especially after a marriage, when the, the narcissist feels secure, they don't have to turn on the charm as much. They could just be the obnoxious self. And then- their partner doesn't feel they're getting their needs met. They're feeling hurt or lonely, abused, neglected, dismissed, all these feelings. And then it just starts not working anymore for and other reasons also. But you asked about, do they like being controlled? Well, one thing is most codependents uh, don't, I mean, there's different types. I said, there's types that want to be, um, more uh, in control, more like executives. They don't have to be a narcissist. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to be leaders. They're more aggressive, more goal-oriented. And then there's other codependents that are more passive mm -hmm. and accommodating. So those are the majority. And the stereotypical codependent is someone who's a pleaser, they always say. So they haven't tapped into their own agenic qualities it's like agency is where that word comes from mm, okay take the initiative they're more comfortable in a setting where you're told what to do like in a school in a corporation um so even it's better to have a partner so they don't have to do it on their own they rather be number two than number one yeah okay and so they that's a part of themselves that is not expressed. I talked about repressed anger. Well, this is like repressed initiative. Mm -hmm. There's a section in my book, Codependency for Dummies, called You Lost Your Mojo. Mm -hmm. I lost my mojo. Mm -hmm. So they admire someone who's a bold, a leader, you know, spontaneous, who takes action. They think that's strong and they're attracted to that person. Only later they find out, oh, he or she is very controlling and demanding. Mm -hmm. So initially they might be, a, not exactly control, but someone who takes charge, put it that way. And later they're the subject, the target of that control. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So if we're identifying ourselves as maybe fitting into this category, which is probably a big deal to get to that realization, what's the next step? How do you start managing it? Well, learn all you can about codependency. It used to be like a dirty word, but you know, here's the news. Most everybody's codependent. Sure. So in some cultures, it's, uh, it's expected. Again, in co collectivist cultures, mm -hmm. the family is more important than the individual. Mm -hmm. And everybody's in everybody's business. Everyone else's business yeah. is very enmeshed. And so I have, I have clients or people that write me that their parents were immigrants. And it's very hard for them to separate from the family because they get shunned if they try to have their own ideas, their own opinions, their own interests. Uh, a partner who's outside of their religion or their ethnic group. And so it's very difficult for them. So learn all you can about codependency and start paying attention to your negative self-talk. So before I wrote the Dummies book, I wrote two ebooks because and i'll describe them to you um recovering from codependency is a lot of it is learning new skills that you didn't learn in family it's not a diagnosis like a mental disorder or a personality disorder that you have from birth um, or genetic it's something that you learned 
or coping skills, as you, you said. So one of the things you need to learn is how to build your self-esteem. So self-esteem is learned. And that's how you think about yourself. And the biggest obstacle to self-esteem is this negative self-talk. Yeah. So start writing it down. You can wear, I have a YouTube where I have a, a suggestion to wear a rubber band. And every time you shirt on yourself or uh, blame yourself or call yourself names, all of that, just snap it and mm. write it down every day because what's unconscious will control you. Mm. So you want to make this critic very conscious. And I wrote an ebook and then I also have a webinar called How to Be Assertive. I mean, uh, How to Raise Your Self Esteem. Mm -hmm. And the ebook is 10 Steps to Self Esteem. And there's 10 exercises to overcome self criticism. The other skill that people need to have is assertiveness mm -hmm. and how to set boundaries. So another symptom or two more symptoms of codependency are dysfunctional boundaries and dysfunctional communication. So in your family, okay. likely there was a lot of aggression or passivity or no one talked um, or passive aggressiveness, but more than likely there was not assertiveness, which means making I statements and there's a whole mm. list of things that go into it. So the other ebook and webinar I have is how to be assertive and how to speak your mind. And so learn, and that could take years of practice. It takes practice, practice, practice. Mm -hmm. So um, learn to make I statements. In order to make I statements, you have to know what you're feeling. Mm. So another symptom of codependency is denial. So we talked about how parents shame feelings and needs. So you may be in denial of your needs, in denial of your feelings. And then you might know what they are, but then you judge them. Mm. So you have to be know what they are. You have to accept them, honor them, and like a good parent, meet your needs. Know what your needs are, not shame yourself for them. Like, oh, I should be over him by now or things like that. Um, I shouldn't feel this way. Accept how you feel. And then ask yourself, what do you need? And that's really hard for codependents because they didn't get their needs met. Um, so you can start journaling. In the Dummies book, I list about 200 feelings and about 60 needs. And it's very hard sometimes to identify feelings and then even harder to identify needs. Because if your needs weren't named, if they were shamed, if they weren't met, you won't know what they are and, and then how to meet them. I mean, for a lot of years, I didn't realize when I was lonely. I know it sounds ridiculous, <laughs> but I would isolate when I was upset. And it never occurred to me to reach out to people. Because mm. you thought you should be able to handle it on your own? No, I didn't know I was lonely. Ah, okay. I didn't even name, you know, I might be sad or something or anxious, whatever I'm feeling. And then as I started to be able to identify it and say, oh, I'm lonely. I might cry for like 30 seconds mm -hmm. and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. So just acknowledging it, I tell people to say, to name, this is what a parent should do, name the feeling. Mm -hmm. And then research has shown if you call yourself by name. So I would say, Darlene, you're lonely. Mm -hmm. And I would add, and it's okay. So that's what a good parent would do. They would talk to the child and name the feelings. That's how a child learns to identify feelings mm -hmm. and then give them comfort mm -hmm. or what they need. Maybe you're, you're tired. Oh, you need to rest. Mm -hmm. You're hungry or you need, you know, inspiration or you need exercise. There's a whole lot of things we need. So, so, so your true we, self then is to, to be that parent that you didn't have and get to acknowledge and mirror back the needs and the feelings and talk to yourself if you didn't get the parenting that you were looking for because you get to be your own advocate now right the the, the true self has all these needs and feelings mm -hmm. and i have another blog on my website called um how to heal the trauma of your inner or how to heal your inner child mm -hmm. something like that the trauma of the inner child and there is about a dozen exercises you could do on your own that I do with clients that I work with mm -hmm. to have start to acknowledge that child 
Um, you might say, seem silly to you to think about there's a child that lives inside of us. Uh, so don't even use that word if you don't like it. Just get in touch with your feelings, your needs. And so then the third skill, so I mentioned raising your self-esteem and learning to be assertive. And the third word is learning to nurture yourself and take care of yourself. And that could be really hard. It's some of the things I've mentioned. And I have um, a self-love meditation on my website. Mm -hmm. And I have a couple articles on um, self-love and self-nurturing. I have a YouTube video on three exercises that you can do. Um, they're visualizations. Because if you weren't nurtured, then you won't know how to do it. So uh, sometimes people confuse sex and nurturing. Maybe that's the only kind of intimacy they experienced or touch. This is so wonderful, Darlene. I mean, you are just a wealth of information and so many wonderful resources and books. And I mean, we're just like scratching the surface of like how prevalent codependency is and how the guilt and the shame and the ways that we speak to ourselves are just continuing to keep us in that loop. So tell us what your website is so that we can go get some of these wonderful freebies and, and blogs and, sure. and exercises mm -hmm. that you talk about. Uh, you can search my name, Darlene Lancer, L-A-N-C-E-R. You can also go to whatiscodependency.com. Uh, the, the first website is linked to the, the other, and I have um, um, a media page with lots of uh, interviews and podcasts and uh, webinars. I have YouTube. I'm on social media, Instagram, and uh, Darlene Lancer LMFT, and Facebook, and Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Um, and I have audio uh, recordings on that you can find them from my website, but they're on Clip It and Sound. Um, SoundCloud. Mm -hmm. and I think that probably covers everything, but you, you're, have, you're all over the place. Yes. Just go to your website and there's lots of ways to link. And I am eternally grateful that you were willing to take some time out of writing your hundred thousandth <laughs> book to spend a little time with us, to educate us and to give us hope and some resources. So I really appreciate you, Darlene. Oh, thank you very much for inviting okay. Thanks for tuning into The D-Spot. Find me, Dr. Dana McNeil, and my guests on social media using the links down below. Subscribe for new episodes weekly and leave a comment letting us know how and if you can relate or what topics you'd like us to cover next. See you next time. And don't forget, going to therapy is cool.